Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Modern Golden Age Podcast. Today with me, I have Jose Gonçalves uh, from Unchat. Jose, how are you? Hi, Joel. Thank you for inviting me to be on the podcast. I'm good. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And today we'll talk about, as usual, Modern Golden Age. But first, I want to start with a totally different topic, which is uh, part of my job as well, which is entrepreneurship. And usually when I get people here, uh, we've talked about some businesses, but uh, usually they're more like content uh, creation business. You're actually founding a startup. So I want to start there. Like, how did you get into uh, this world of entrepreneurship? So in the world of entrepreneurship, I kind of got in by mistake because most of my family works in small businesses, small like local businesses. And so entrepreneurship was always part of my life in some way. Yeah. And then I got to know what startups were, what Y Combinator was, what those, what venture capital was, what those kind of things were. And I started freelancing, doing design for freelance. And so because I'm not good with schedules, not good with following orders, I always wanted to work for myself. And so a startup appeared as a natural progression after freelancing. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, you were saying that you came in touch with startups and Y Combinator and all that stuff. Like, how did that happen? So that happened because, as I said, I was always into entrepreneurship because of my family. And so that leads to hustle porn online, which no longer serves me well, but did at some point. Uh, and then that leads me to follow CEOs on Twitter, follow them on LinkedIn, on all kinds of social media. And mm -hmm. then you sort of get bombarded with content that is about investing, that is about companies, that is about all of those things. And startups are a niche inside of that. And so mm. it is a niche that was particularly appealing to me and one that I just fell into both on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and like personal connections, yeah. Yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Why? The, what happened in what, what, what there is, what is there in, in startups that, that made you be more interested in that specific part? That's because one, they have the culture of something that I like to call fuck around and find out. So <laughs> you, you just go around, you do your thing. And if it goes well, it goes well. If it doesn't go well, you iterate on it. And it's also a community where you don't need to know anyone in the beginning to get in because people are always welcoming others. Whereas, mm -hmm. for example, if you go into finance or other kinds of business, it's a very tight community that doesn't let foreigners or outsiders in. Mm -hmm. Whereas in startups, like you can just call DM some of the CEOs of the biggest companies in the world and they mm -hmm. will literally book a call with you for nothing. Mm -hmm. Has that happened to you? Yeah, that has happened to me. Do you mind sharing who? I would not be able to share who. Okay, that's right. I tried. <laughs> but that has happened. <laughs> People that were listening to the podcast, you saw it, I tried. Uh, but... <laughs> But yeah, so um, I, I'll I'll totally get what you're saying because I, I believe that there's this there's this totally different vibe uh, in terms of, of when when you're into uh, the the entrepreneurship and the startup actually environment and then in a corporate environment and things are totally different. Uh, and so I, I totally get. It. Why do you think that is though? Why do you think that we're uh, in 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 startups the the environment the people are way more friendly and welcoming to others than let's say in corporate? I think that is because people in startups are sort of all of them in the same battle, which is finding product market fit, which means making something that people want, making something that the market reacts to. And that mm -hmm. is incredibly different, difficult and there's no pretend work involved in it. Mm -hmm. So whereas in the corporate world, there are bigger companies. And so you start to have all of this like political views and hierarchical mm -hmm. things and all of that. In early stage startups, everyone is just thriving to build something that people mm -hmm. want. And so there's a lot of empathy when other people can't and when other people can. There's a lot of like people just trying to help each other because they know how hard it is. Yeah. And I also think, and this is only my theory, but I also think that most people in startups are actually working on something that they believe will benefit the world. And I don't think that's totally true uh, in, in corporate. Like I'm not passing judgment. I'm just considering something that I've seen which is basically when you talk with someone about startups, they're actually having building something that they believe that can change the world and they're positive about it and they really want to welcome feedback and other people that somehow are like-minded that they want to have a positive impact. Whereas in, in corporate, sometimes uh, my experience is, is rather different. I do have a lot of friends that work in corporate and love it, but 
most people that I know actually are working on a job that, that they don't actually understand how it connects with the bigger vision of the company and have like this, this, this struggle. Do you think that that's the case? You don't agree? Yeah, that is definitely true in some senses. And to me, what is even more true is that people usually build something that they want to exist, period. Like even if it doesn't change the world, it's something that they want to exist. Mm -hmm. For example, last week I was talking with someone from a, an app, like an app that is basically a, a music creation app that lets you okay. record things on your phone and just publish them right away. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, okay, why did you guys start this app? And it is now in the, in the top charts in the US. And the guy, this is, I was talking to the CTO and mm -hmm. the guy basically turns to me and says, well, our CEO can sing and he really wanted to sing. So we created <laughs> an app, we created an app that makes him sing well. <laughs> and this awesome. was the reason behind it. What's, what's the name of the app though? It's MyKit. So it's M-A-Y-K uh, space IT. Yeah. Okay. Because I got a few friends that don't sing well that will love that app. Definitely. Yeah. The okay. app is pretty good though. Yeah, awesome. So let's get into your own startup. Like, lead us to your story. So basically, you get in touch with all this reality, white combinator startups, all that stuff. Like, where is how did how does that transform into you creating and chat? So during October 2019, I was doing the PC of 42. That for the people who don't know, it's a, a free coding school and because it is free it has a very intensive like selection process of a month like a full month and so i was in the middle of that and twitter i'm a twitter power user and twitter released a feature called fleets which are essentially a copy of insta stories and snap stories yeah let me um, just stop you there just to ask you something for those who don't, who don't know can you please explain what's a twitter power user oh twitter power user basically someone who, who tweets way too much way too often <laughs> Awesome. That's what it is. Let's get in. Um, and so Twitter releases fleets, as I said, the, the copy of Snap uh, of Insta Stories and Snap Stories. And I look at it and I look at it as a way, like a, a failed opportunity for Twitter to include video in a meaningful way in their feed. Because I would love to post videos in a meaningful way on the feed and not for other people to reply in videos. And so I do a little rant about it on Twitter. And Ernesto who is now my co-founder, at the time we had talked like twice on Twitter, he reaches out to me and he's like, hey, yeah, I also think that something could be built in this area of video communication asynchronously because it's just way more convenient than what we have now in terms of video like Zoom, uh, but it is also way more personal than Twitter. And so during that night, we jump on the Discord call and start sketching out something that changed a lot with, with time, obviously, but something that would eventually become on chat. Yeah, awesome. So Let's get into the story. So you, you understand you have that, you do that this call with your next, you start to create that, then what happens? So as I said, this was October 2019, and we start to just like talk with each other about it, maybe on the weekends, during the night, something like that. And the project sort of evolves very slowly until like December, yeah, December 2019, January 2020. And at one point, we decide, okay, let's actually make this a thing. Let's make this into a company. Because at that point, it was just a fun project. Yeah. Um, let's what turn it into a company. Let's go full-time in it. And yeah. one problem, we did not have money. <laughs> and ne neither of us were working. And so we obviously needed money. I, just, yeah. uh, Ernesto was actually at another startup. And so we needed money to start with this. Yeah. And what made you out of, out of nowhere... Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Because I'm really curious, what, what made you like um, make that decision of switching from a side project to actually building that? Uh, one, it was something that we were really enjoying doing that we could see a future on. And two, we were already kind of indoctrinated in the startup way of thinking. And so we wanted mm -hmm. to just go after it and oh. see what happened. Awesome. So yeah, as I was saying, we needed money for that. And then miraculously, someone reached out on LinkedIn because like, I started posting things about our project on LinkedIn and someone reached out and was like, hey, you should apply to this, like this investment firm called Hook.VC. They are a French venture, venture capital firm. Um, and so we fill out the application. We do two interviews with them and they invest in the company. And then we can, we can actually focus on it full time without worrying about other things. Yeah. So... What does Unchat specifically do? So at Unchat, we're building the best app to talk with friends on video. 
And what does that look like right now is an app where you have private video groups, where in, inside each of the group, you can post videos and reply with videos in the same way that you do on Twitter, for example. This means that you can talk with your friends asynchronously and very personally, because I'll send a video and it stays there inside of our group feed. And you'll reply with another video that will get organized in a thread structure, just like it would on Twitter. And so you can just scroll through conversations with your friends while seeing their faces and where you can reply whenever you want. Yeah. And so how's tracking? Uh, like, are people getting in and are you happy with results? So two months ago, we launched our first version and our first version did not have the private groups that I'm talking about right now. Mm -hmm. It was essentially Twitter on video. That's what we built. Yeah. Um, and the reactions on that were that the, the idea was really good, but there was a major problem, which was that video is much more personal, which we already know. And yeah. so because of that, people wanted to talk only with other specific people. And there mm -hmm. were parts of each conversation that other people could not listen to. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we decided to build private groups that we have not yet launched publicly. We are planning on launching in the next two months. Awesome. So we, we are internal testing, but it will take at least two months. Yeah, yeah, awesome. That's that's such a great idea, and yeah, and, and video is such a powerful thing, right? Like like as you said, uh, it, it allows you to connect deeper with the person. Uh, it allows you sometimes to expose ideas in in a, in a different way, and and the whole communication is way more complete, right? Uh, when when you're when you're writing, you just have the the meaning of the words, right? Uh, but in a video, you can actually see the person, hear the person, and, and have a more complete understanding of what they're trying to say, right? Yeah. One very interesting thing that happened to me was that I started speaking with someone on Hunchat before starting on any other platform. And we spoke for like, I think, two weeks before we met each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we met each other, it was almost as if we had been friends for a while. Yeah. Like, I already knew his facial expressions. I already knew the way he talked. He already knew the way yeah. I talked. I think the only thing that was surprising was how tall we are. We were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's something that online doesn't fix, uh, regardless of the product that you build. So, uh, but, but but that's a, such an an, an interesting thing because most of the times when you meet someone through when you have an online conversation, um, before you most of, sometimes you don't jump into a call. You just switch on DMs and then you meet a call uh, to to have coffee and there's this mismatch not mismatch but like this almost like this small period of time where you need to calibrate the other person but basically what you guys do or by meeting someone through your app and then meeting with that person you actually allow for that calibration process to happen before so then you can point together that's so uh that's so interesting have you have you had like any customer feedback about that as well about that sort of interaction yeah yeah, we've had uh, so groups of friends have started to talk with it because, as I said, we are we're testing, so there's a few people using it already. Um, and the sense is pretty much what you said that there's no mismatch. Even though we're now more worried about people talking with their existing friends than meeting new mm -hmm. ones, mm -hmm. uh, it's just way more personal. Also, than for example, some people listening might be thinking, okay, why don't they just create a group on Instagram, for example? Mm -hmm. And the, the reason for that is that when you, whenever you're talking about consumer social products, some very small changes make a really big impact on the way people use the product. Mm -hmm. And so whereas if you have a group on Instagram, people might send uh, a, a text to say something. If they are on chat, they will send a video because there's no other way to do it. And then mm -hmm. they'll end up saying something slightly different and they'll end up like putting their voice into it. Mm. And so the whole thing just becomes way more personal, even without people realizing it. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you basically, you, you switch the environment in order to let a different kind of conversation naturally emerge. That makes a little sense. Yeah. Uh, speaking of emergence, like we've met because uh, we've crossed paths on Twitter, uh, which is basically the way I, invite everyone to the podcast so far, I think. Uh, and and uh, we met on Twitter. And I, when I first met you, I actually, I didn't, it was not because of, of, of Unchat, it was because uh, you were talking, I don't remember specifically, but we were talking about the, the kind of thing that one talks about Twitter, in Twitter. So philosophy uh, and meaning and all that stuff. So my first question was, how did you get into this, this in-group uh, that where, where we were in? So like I've answered before, it also started with entrepreneurship, curiously, and it also went through the cycle of like hustle porn, then Y Combinator, and then CEOs and all of those things. 
And those sort of led me into Twitter. And I used to use Twitter as most teenagers do, just rambling about my life. And all of a certain, all of a sudden, I found communities like Interintellect, which your podcast listeners might already know of. Yeah. Um, so Interintellect, and then this thing called InGroup or Post Rats or whatever. And at that time, I was also reading things on rationalist forums like Less Wrong, and blogs like the Slate Star Codex, and I just sort of picked up all of those things and started following people from those communities on Twitter, and. Mm -hmm. I found myself in the middle of it, and I love that. Yeah, and yeah. so one of the things that I truly believe about about Twitter is that there's this obsession in our corner, right? Because Twitter is is this whole world, and we're talking specifically about uh, a niche part of Twitter. In that niche part, we have like this obsession um, with our minds. Uh, and I was wondering if, like, where do you think that that comes from? In a way, I think a lot of that comes from alienation, mm. and that, that that might be that might not be something very beautiful to hear, but it, it is a common theme among the people inside of these communities mm. that they all have some kind of personal alienation in their past, mm. Mm. and I'll, so I'll... that that search of that search for knowledge, very mm. often or more often than not, includes a search for community a search yeah. for fitting in, a search for understanding things in the way that other people already seem to understand it, but it does not come natural to you. Yeah, yeah. That makes a little sense. So I'll, I'll ask you how, uh, like, what, what was your experience? I'll, I'll give my mind first to, to let you think about it, and then I'll ask you what was your experience of alienation uh, following your own theory, because that, that makes some sense. Like, I remember that my first experience having uh, feeling like I was completely out of the pack was when I decided to study music. And literally all my friends told me, well, don't do this. You'll end up dying with the drug overdose when you're 23. Don't, don't make it. You'll end up starving, all that stuff. And I remember believing in my innocent mind that I would make that decision and they will still be there for me. And what happens was in, in, in 10th grade, uh, I, I took that season, started studying music, and I ended up feeling absolutely alienated from almost everyone I knew while in high school, uh, which is a place where, a place now, a time where you uh, have a lot of things happening in your body, in your social relationships. So uh, that was the moment where I first felt that. And I understood that sometimes you need to, um, you need to understand that your community is not actually a community is basically just a bunch of people that happens to be around in the same place and you're but when you find a community you find through common values common interests not because you share like this specific space or or, or uh, a specific time like a, a class um so to me that was one of my first moments where i felt alienated how about you yeah for me i'd also say it was during adolescence um and it was mostly because I'm from a, a small village. And so all of the things that make a small village absolutely amazing for a child can make it very difficult for an, an uh, I'm missing the word, little adolescent, yeah, for an adolescent, for a teenager yeah. that wants to explore something else. And so while a very, a very closed community where everyone knows each other and everyone is in the same sort of thing, while you're a child is pretty much phenomenal. There's nothing better than that, in my opinion. Um, when you start turning into a teenager and you have, you want to explore other things, you want to explore other ways of doing things, you want to, I don't know, just go out, see a different way to see the world, it sort of becomes difficult. And mm -hmm. as you said, when you really believe for yourself in things that people around you don't believe, you sort of start to question whether you're, whether you're the one that is right or the other people are right. And so to, to me, that was my, that was the, the first time where I was like, mm, maybe I don't belong. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the bright side of that, after a while, you do realize that you belong. You just have to do some inner work. And it's, it's kind of the, the hero's journey thing all over mm -hmm. again, where you, where you come back to the same place. And that's actually happening with me right now. Uh, mm -hmm. You come back to the same place and you now belong, not because mm -hmm. the place is different, but because you're different. Yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah, it, it. but like to, to start that hero's journey, you need to have like the belief that in the beginning, like as you were saying, you start the question, am I right? 
or are these am I wrong or are these people wrong? And in order to get to that full journey, you need to first believe that you're right, they're wrong, and I need to act upon this this idea. So you can then do all the process and come back to well, maybe we were both right. Maybe we just are looking at the same thing from these different perspectives, and that's fine. But in a, in in a first moment, you need to believe in 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 what you're in what you're in what you believe basically so what made you not quit and and conform and actually pursue that that idea to be I, honest i have I have no idea mm. <laughs> I, I think it takes it takes uh it takes a contrarian to do that you need to be a little bit stubborn a little bit arrogant sometimes mm. or at least come out as arrogant even though you're not doing it um but yeah you do need to believe that you know better, which sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, as yeah. most things. But uh, you, you're absolutely right. If you don't have that initial push of being like, no, I'm right in this one, you will never start the journey to some some different place. Yeah, because I'm asking, because I, I, I meet a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, who they, they have like this insight moments where they understand that maybe I, I, I believe into something that this group doesn't and maybe this is right, but then they'll end up conforming. Like a, a lot of people I, I, talk to me and, came, and and that's the story they tell. Oh, I used to believe in that as well, but then I got trapped into this conversation and these people in this group and I ended up not pursuing it. And I, 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 I'm looking like if in your life while you were a teenager or, or while you were uh, a child did you had that contrarian attitude and, and sometimes uh what as you said came, comes out as arrogance um and that and the moment that you decide to explore other ways of doing stuff was just one more moment of you being like that or was it like uh a different transformation yeah no, i'd say i've always been a, a contrarian in that sense yeah that's yeah. that's something that people portray me as ever since I was a, a small child. Yeah, yeah. And and w one thing that really helped me there was the internet, because on one hand you're talking to all of these people in your re real life that agree with A and you agree with B and you're kind of alone agreeing with B and then you go online and there's all of these other people agreeing with B. It doesn't matter if B is right or not, yeah. but you feel like okay, uh, maybe I'm not that crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the beauty of the internet, right? Is that no matter what, what's your belief or what's your taste or what's your thing, you'll definitely find a group of people that shares it uh, with you. Um, yeah, it's, it's both yeah. a blessing and a curse sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, it has was positive and negative. So yeah, and, and so in, in, inside of this area, um, like in, inside of this this part of the video, what are some of your favorite areas? Like what you're exploring, what do you like to talk about? Well, I really love psychology. I'm getting into philosophy and I literally by mistake found what epistemology was and really started to, to dig into it. Yeah. So, so let's the, go to th those I'd say are my three and also self development. Yeah. Self development. Let's let's go through each one of those, right? Um so let's talk with, start with epistemology, which is the one that I'm not at all familiar. I do know what it is, but um it's not something that I've worked on. Can you please explain what it is? And so, what else? yeah, go ahead. Epistemology is the search for knowledge or the search for the meaning of knowledge, for where knowledge comes from, how knowledge evolved through time. It's basically the, the meta science of science, if you will, because you're going one level below and being like, okay, I have all of this knowledge, but where did it, where did this all come from? How did it get to me? Uh, like, why is it the way it is and that's yeah. that's the base of epistemology at least yeah. the way i see it yeah and why does that interest you? because recently and maybe not so recently but explicitly recently i've been interested in meta levels of things mm. uh and this goes to epistemology this goes to philosophy this goes to self-development where i look at something and i'm like okay this happened Oh, why? And it's yeah, it's sort of this systemic post-formal thinking where you just think of things in systems and their interactions with each other instead of seeing them as isolated cases. And it just yeah. it has helped me a ton in, in my life, just navigating through life. Because yeah. for example, one one example that I usually give is that uh, I I didn't go to school, I played the game of school, mm. which basically means that on fourth grade, instead of writing when 
teachers asked us to write big texts, I usually wrote poems because I understood that poems were not common. They liked it because it was not common and it was supposedly harder, but mm -hmm. it was better for me because I had to write less words. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I kind yeah. of made my way through school hacking the system in these little ways. Uh, yeah. it, it, it sort of worked. And so I, I've been thinking in this systematic way at least since fourth grade, even though I didn't know I was doing it. Obviously. Yeah. When 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 did you when did you when did you realize that you were thinking that way? Like, was there any moment when you realized, oh look, I suddenly I understand that in fourth grade I did that because I was thinking this way. Um, I don't think that was a moment, but it was in the last three years for sure. It was mm -hmm. something that has been happening in the last three years, like a, a build up into season <laughs> thinking. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that for sure. Yeah, and so um. You were saying like you're interested in what in the layer that that that's deeper than what ha actually happened. So I have a question like you did that on fourth grade, right? What's the layer been, like deeper than that? Like why did you do that? What does that represent to you? Well, it represents that I understood what was going around and that what teachers were asking me were not act was not actually what they wanted to see. Mm. But they wanted to see me struggle to write a text mm. and just deliver something. Mm. Okay, and th so, that remains useful in university, by the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, taking to 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 the other uh, three areas that you mentioned, like psychology, how did you get into psychology? I have no idea. <laughs> I literally have no idea. I think yeah. I saw people like speaking on Twitter about things that I absolutely did not understand. Yeah. And so I just went after it. And then they started referencing authors and things like that. And mm. you just start reading about them. And you find yourself with a basic understanding of the thing. Yeah. For example, the, the one, the authors I know now are Piaget, Kohlberg, mm. Robert Kengen, and yeah. Carl Rogers. Those yeah. are the ones I've been reading about. And I literally found all of them through references online. Yeah. Yeah. And what's like, because psychology, psychology to me is one of my favorite areas, um, because I, I, I'm fascinated by human behavior, as we've talked previously, uh, and I really like to understand, like, why people do certain things, and why um, there are awesome people, or actually why there are, like, these phenomenal performers, and then there's this really bad performance, but then there's people that are phenomenal and then go bad, and there's people that are, so are bad and then go up. Like, what are the changes that happen? And usually, most of the times, the change is is somehow somehow and somewhere inside their mind, right? So psychology to me is, is this fascinating topic. And I was wondering, like, from this vast world of knowledge uh, that, that that is psychology, what are some of your favorite things, notions, concepts, ideas um, to, to explore? Uh, this is leading more towards self-development, but I really like IFS, General Family Systems, mm. because that, that way of thinking has allowed me to like view things in a way I was not viewing before and therefore unlock uh, certain yeah. problems that I was bumping into. Yeah. So IFS is one, shadow work is another one, which is also sort of related to the same thing. Mm. And more recently, the kick and stages of human development yeah. is pretty much my favorite thing right now. But it's also something I've read recently, so that sometimes happens. Maybe I'll yeah. read something next week that becomes my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I really like the, the king and stages of human development precisely because it goes to the, the last meta level, the mean making. Yeah. And so one of the things that I, I, I found out about, like a lot of people that somehow um, are, end up being entrepreneurs or having this almost like uh, desire of, of, of knowledge is that they're always seeking to be better. Uh, is that fair to say about you? Yes. Yeah, so where do you think that that, that that comes from? Like being this type A, focused on goals, focused on how can I improve, how can I be better, how can I believe in better things? Like where do you think that that, that, that specific personality comes from? Well, in, in the same way that I said in the beginning that the focus on this part of Twitter or on these topics must come from some kind of alienation. I think that the when, when you're striving to be better, somehow you're making the assumption that you're not good enough for X. Even, even though that X might not exist yet, yeah. uh, you're not 
good enough for whatever you want to do. And so that's that's a bit of the, the dark side of self-development is that it presupposes that you're not good enough. Yeah. And, and, and so while, like, while, while yeah, that, there, that's kind of a coercive view on it, which is something I'm trying to drift away from, uh, the journey is also really good. Like, yeah. you, get, you get better at something almost without realizing it sometimes, you know, like, damn, <laughs> damn, that was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's, that's why I'm asking. There was a moment in my life where I, I would read anything that would be related to self-development and I wanted to be like this, almost like this non-human thing, like this superhero where I have all the knowledge, and I have all these perfect beliefs and I have all these performance. And the problem with that is that there's also, there's always another book to read. And so consequently, there's also a new strategy to try. And because of that, you're always feeling incomplete, right? You're always seeking something and, and the pattern becomes, or, or the default state becomes seeking instead of finding. Um, and, and I was wondering, like, have you find a balance between those two things? Like, because uh, to I, me, what I, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'd say that very recently, I've started to find that balance. So I'm, I'm no longer just seeking for the next book or seeking for the next podcast or whatever. I'm sort of just vibing and enjoying the thing that comes. Yeah. The, were there any specific practices that you started to do that led you to that state? No, it was mostly the insight that knowledge alone would take me nowhere. And I would probably learn more about human development and human behavior by going out with my friends and by reading a book about it. Or yeah. ideally reading a book about it and then going and out go. with my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that makes a total sense. Yeah, so um, as you know, switching a little bit uh, on topics, as you know, this podcast focuses on this idea called uh, the modern golden age. And one of the questions that I like I, when I started the podcast, my first idea was I need to have a real clear vision about what a modern golden age is. Um, and, and so I actually delayed the podcast for a few months because I was always trying to understand, trying to come up with this perfect theory of what a modern golden age looks like. And then I had like this insight that that would take me nowhere because uh, I do believe that one of the things uh, that happens in a modern golden age is there's this um, predisposition, predisposition, I think that yeah, uh, we yeah. said, uh, to co-create something. And so I, I realized that I was being pretty selfish coming up with this uh, perfect framed idea of what a modern golden age looked like and instead of doing it what i should do was talk with the different people to talk a lot with different people and understand what their views on a modern golden age are and then try to see the different patterns and the common threads among different people so one of the questions that i always do is what is to you uh, a modern golden age hmm. that is, that's a tough one i should have predicted it though <laughs> um to me, a modern golden age is a time where there's a lot of social intercourse between friendly, ambitious people, and you're getting the reference, obviously. Yeah. Um, and those people align in some way to do something. And I'm, I'm being purposefully vague on something and somewhere because that doesn't really matter. Yeah. As long as they are connected, like there's a lot of serendipity between ambitious people and they're thriving to do something. Yeah, yeah, and that, that makes a little sense. And one of the things that I, I try to, to understand is that, like, let's say that we have that, and, and I like that you're vague because I believe that in order for us to get into a modern golden age, we need to, like, design this as a way that it's flexible uh, to, to, to let different projects emerge. But, however, there are common practices that we need to have, and I do also believe, like, I... I I have this theory that to, to create a modern golden age, we'll need to have some common practices, values, beliefs, and goals. And like I was wondering, like to you, for us to get into that state, um, and regardless of that happening in a city, in the whole world, in the internet, in the, in the small community, like what are some of the values that you believe one needs to have or the, the community has to have in order to make that possible? I'd say one honesty and intellectual honesty to uh, the, I don't know what the, what the objective is, but the ability to change opinion based on new facts mm. while at the same time being a contrarian when you feel like you should be one, which is mm. something that is hard to balance as we talked before. Um, 
three, trust for sure. Trust that the other people are thriving for the same meta goal as you. And yeah. I think this would be the base of it, yeah. Yeah, why each one? Why do you think we... So we, yeah. trust is because you cannot, one, be yourself, two, you cannot expose your ideas in a freely way before you trust in your environment. You'll always be locked in yourself. And so trust is the basis of cooperation. Yeah. Then the, the ability to change ideas or opinions based on your information is, I think, essential to anyone who wants to progress because you don't know what every, every said, as we said before, you don't know everything. There's always going to be new information popping in and you yeah. need to be able to adapt to it and yeah. move forward. Then on the other side of that, we have being a contrarian and being a contrarian is the exact opposite because sometimes new information comes and you need to disregard it as noise and be like, no, I know that this is the way to go. And mm -hmm. that's how most scientific progress is made. That's how most progress in general is made. Mm -hmm. Even the other day, I, I read a, a tweet saying, you don't want to be a politician putting forward new, new ideas or supporting them because the fact that it is a new idea means that they are being pushed by a contrarian, which means that no, not a lot of people believe in them, which mm -hmm. means you don't like get votes. So yeah, this balance between being adaptable and a contrarian. Mm -hmm. And then the first one I said was honesty and intellectual honesty. Yeah. And that also comes as a base for cooperation and for serendipity within the group. Because if you're not honest, like morally in the way you feel about certain theory, about certain things, mm -hmm. about a certain person, like more personally, you will not have trust, which in turn, you'll not have good cooperation. And mm -hmm. intellectual honesty works in the same way, but when you're discussing like non-personal matter. Mm, ideas. So one of the things that you mentioned, and that's common to, I think, almost all of the guests so far uh, is cooperation and serendipity. And like, uh, what do you think we need to do in order to promote that? Like, how do, how do we create an environment where people feel uh, seen, heard, and, and supported by? And uh, at the same time, have the desire to cooperate with different people to create new projects? I would say in, in a very tangible way, it means to talk to a ton of people in a friendly way and just hear what they have to say. Yeah. yeah. Like it makes this, this, is, this is very simple and tangible, but I think that if people, if a, a large enough group actually does that, it, yeah. it seems to work. Yeah. Because, cause, and, and that's like, and that's a segue into the practice because that's one practice that one can do, right? Which is talk to a lot of people, talk with a lot of people and do it in a friendly way. And one of the things that I actually found fascinating was that I had some people on the show um, already and, and some people that have DM on Twitter and talked about, and this goes back to uh, the thing that you mentioned before, which is like, you can DM a CEO and talk with them. And I think that that approach specifically works, at least in my experience in Twitter, uh, more than on any uh, other social platform for platforms, and I'm including LinkedIn specifically. Uh, to me, at least Twitter as, as that. Um, and a lot of people that I've talked with were surprise, surprisingly friendly with me. And I wasn't expecting that. I, I was expecting like this, I, I, I'll find this wall that I, I'll need to breach in order to, to make a connection. And that didn't happen at all. So that makes a little sense. What are some other practices that we should um, do in order, to, in order to bring that model golden age in your perspective? Well, besides the friendly part with other people, which I believe to be the most important one, because the modern golden age to me is more about people getting together and doing something than anything else. Besides that, it's doing your own work. Like mm. you're only for better or for worse in intellectual or spiritual or whatever communities, you'll only accept it by the work you do first for yourself, um, which is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but it ensures quality inside of the communities, at least uh, intellectual quality. And so other than bouncing ideas with others, other than being friendly with others, is actually going out and doing the thing you want to do. So for you, it would be this podcast. For me, it would be my startup. And you'll notice that for most people inside of these communities, they have some sort of thing going on, yeah. whether it's writing or music or podcast or company or yeah. software engineering or something, they have their thing going on. And their thing is going to always exist in parallel with the other things. And they will sort of support each other and hopefully yeah. elevate each other in some way. 
Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I, I truly believe is that, and and I've talked about this previously on the podcast, which is uh, I I believe that be, not only having your thing, but actually sharing sharing it with others. Like, uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Because because that's what then allows for serendipity and different connections and and different um and, and different projects. And in order to share what you're building, that's why I truly believe that one of the most core values in, 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 in the modern golden age is, is courage. Like, I do believe that you need to have courage in order to, first of all, be friendly, because that's not easy. At least I, in my perspective, I think that there's a lot of people who are not friendly because being friendly means being vulnerable. It means yep. being willing to have a conversation where I'll open up my feelings and I'll expect that you won't hurt me. Uh, and so I, I do believe that courage is fundamental because of that, but also because regardless of what your thing is, you'll only reap the rewards if you actually share it with others. And sharing your own work is hard uh, sometimes. So I do believe that's also another practice that we, we, we should have. Do, do you agree with this? Yeah, I, I totally agree with it. Because if you're not sharing it, no one's going to know about it. And even if you share it, sometimes it's hard for people to know about it because of the sheer amount of things that are online. Yeah. And so, yeah, 10 out of 10, just share it. It will sometimes be shit. Yeah, <laughs> I, I look at some of the things I've shared in the past, and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but it's part, right? Like, I, I was, it's funny, because I, I was doing, um, I, I don't know, do, do you take notes? This is uh, yeah. very tense. Uh, what's the software you use? I just use Google Docs mostly. Uh, okay, perfect. So I, I've been using Rome lately. Uh, and I've been, I absolutely love it. And I remember that one of the things that I had to do was basically get my previous essays that I've published and put them on, on, on Rome and tag them, right? And that was such a painful process. Like thinking of something that I've written about like five months ago and reading that and thinking, Jesus Christ, what <laughs> is this? But, but, it, but it's part of the journey, right? It's part of what you have to do because, because that's, why maybe I publish something right now and I look at it and I think, well, that's so much better than what it was in the past. But in five months, I'll be doing the same thing that and putting things on Rome and then I'll look at it and I'll believe, wow, why, why did I believe that this was a good idea or this was a good, yeah. good answer, right? So that's part of the process. Like, and, and with that comes frustration. And one of the questions that I do have to ask is that I do believe that in order to get the Armada Golden Age, you need to deal with frustration. And like, how do you personally deal with that? Because being an entrepreneur and going full, side, full, full circle is also dealing with a lot of frustration about how your customer works, how the funding works, how the things are, are developing. Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, to build pretty much anything worthwhile, you're probably going to deal with frustration, <laughs> like no matter what you're building. And being a, a startup founder is one of the areas that is particularly known for having to deal with a lot of frustration. Sometimes yeah. I feel like the king of the world. Sometimes I feel like dead, <laughs> yeah. entirely dead. And so for me, I, for context, I used to be really bad at dealing with this. Uh, mm. I'd like go really high into the highs and really low into the lows. Mm. And what helped me deal with it was one, go through many cycles of that. And then two, look at them and be like, okay, there's cycles. And so mm. now when I'm in what, in, any position of the cycle, I'm like, okay, I'm here, but it's in this cycle. Yeah. And so I know what to expect sort of after. Yeah. yeah. And so the, 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 the notion that there's some, like that it repeats itself and that you can sort of locate where you are inside of each cycle is, is really calming to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it allows you to be prepared for what you're about to feel. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. So Jose, I, I, I don't have that many more questions. I do want to ask you, uh, do you, like, what's the connection that you do in your mind, if any, between, like, Unchat and a modern golden age? Oh, that there is definitely a connection. Because as, as we've been saying, the most important thing, or at least as I've been saying, the most important thing is talking with people and allowing serendipity. And we are building or we're attempting to build the best app to talk with friends on video meaning talking with people in a very personal and meaningful way. And so if we can optimize the way people talk with each other through screens like we're doing now, if we can give them better tools to communicate, if we can give them better tools to cooperate, then we can accelerate all kinds of processes, including a modern golden age. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, is the app um, where, where where can people find the app? So the app can be found right now on the App Store. It's called yeah. Hunt Chat Close Friends mm -hmm. on Video, and we're, we're basically launching new versions every single day because we are still in this early testing phase, and so bugs are to be expected and common things are to be expected. <laughs> yeah, but they'll they'll be fixed with time. Yeah, awesome. So. One last question is that if people want to talk with you uh, to either chat entrepreneurship or any other idea, uh, what's the best place to do so? Where can they find you? Right now, find me on Twitter. That's your, your that's absolutely your best shot. So my yeah. Twitter is Jose underscore Gonsalves underscore, which I yeah. know is a terrible tag because most foreign people don't know how to write that. I've been thinking about changing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But well, we, 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 we'll put the, the links in the description. Uh, so people can can access uh, and yeah that's it so Jose thank you so much for doing this it was a real pleasure to talk with you it's especially a real pleasure to talk with someone that's Portuguese as well uh, you're you're like the second Portuguese guest that I have uh, and it's always like this I always feel like this small uh, warm talking with, with with Portuguese people so thank you so much for doing this um, and for being on the show Thank you for inviting me. I love that. Yeah, Great fine. questions. Thank you. Thank you. So to everyone listening, you can subscribe to the podcast. And if you liked it, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. That would mean the world to me. And I'll see you on the next and last episode of this first season. So expect the episode for the next week, which will be really good. Thank you so much. And I'll see you on next week. Bye. Bye.